Okay. Um, Taras, are you ready? Yes, I am. Great. All right. So it's, I'll just introduce you. So it's uh, 8 p.m. Thanks everybody for coming after a long weekend. Um, so Taras Plakotnik is a physicist at the School of Math and Physics. Um, you could read from his first slide that uh, this is not his day-to-day -day profession. If I'm not wrong, Taras, um, back in, in the end of January or early February, you actually shared the uh, John Hopkins dashboard with everybody. Yes, that was me. Yeah. So that already gave it away that you have some mild interest in this uh, emerging story. And uh, we're very thankful for you to speak tonight. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction. And I hope that everybody can hear the sound. No problem with audio. Good. Um, so basically, uh, what I want to do is uh, to show you some of the data that I have collected and uh, some uh, very simple approach to uh, analyze them and then uh, some other information which is available from publications in uh, medical journals and um, other sources about uh, this problem of coronavirus. Okay, so now, uh, you see the title, and um, um, I have to move my mouse to, to here. Okay. Um, so uh, here's an outline. So first I start from something light and positive, uh, not particularly directly related to the, uh, to the disease, but uh, of course it, it is related. Then I will speak about modeling. In particular, we have all this data from mass media, newspapers, TV, whatever you prefer. Uh, cases, number of cases is growing every day. Uh, 30,000 new cases in the United States and so on. Then we also have um, deaths every day. Uh, like uh, 2,000 people died in the United States. It's unsimilar things. Uh, less frequently, we have uh, information about recovery, which is a bit odd because uh, recovery is sort of positive information and uh, very important as a matter of fact. So next I will uh, show you some data and uh, we'll talk about what do they mean actually what is missing? Do we have all the data or we don't? Then um, final, uh, I will show you some new data. They're very, very preliminary. Situation changing every day. And therefore, I mean, I could not really keep my presentation up to date. So I make few changes just uh, one hour ago, but uh, it's still probably already not up to date. And then will be some final notes. I hope you will, I will manage in about 35 minutes. And then maybe there will be discussion. Okay, now um, positive thoughts. Well, as the school of mathematics and physics, you should be happy because people are learning what is an exponent. So this, uh, I, I read this uh, on the ABC site a few days ago. It was on 10th of uh, uh, this month. And uh, they were talking about growth factor, which they define as a ratio of how much is um, the increase of uh, cases today is smaller or larger than uh, the number of new cases yesterday. And then they make a ratio, calculate the ratio. And then the ABC side uh, claim that uh, if this ratio is above one, then we have exponential growth. And if uh, the ratio is less than one, then we don't have exponential growth. Of course, um, this is absolutely nonsense because basically uh, what they're talking about is this ratio. That's the number of cases at time t minus number of cases time t minus delta t and the same 
uh, difference uh, delta t back. And I say that if it's uh, less than one, that is exponential. But basically, it's uh, very loosely speaking, this is a second derivative. And what they say that if second derivative is uh, larger than one, then we have exponential growth. And uh, if it's more than one, that's not. Of course, uh, there are many examples of functions which have uh, second derivative of this property, but it's not exponential. Uh, to my uh, big surprise and uh, satisfaction. Uh, just a few hours later, when I revisited this site, I found that they have changed the text. So they remove exponential growth and replace with alarm bells should be ringing. So uh, at least uh, somebody is learning what the exponential function is. Okay, now the air is getting cleaner. So that's uh, a famous uh, area in Italy where they have most of the cases before the virus and after. So this is a concentration of um, nitrogen dioxide. So it's not very healthy region, as you see. So the Italy, north of Italy, it's very industrial and uh, it has a consequence. So now it looks much better. And even uh, people could see from India, uh, they could see highest mountains. And some local claims that this was uh, first time in uh, a generation or two. So basically like uh, all people remembered 30 years ago, they could see the mountains. Now they can see it again. Well, true or not, not sure. And uh, then uh, journalists are making stories. Some of the stories are very funny and interesting. For example, that this uh, one was on ABC, not our ABC, uh, United States. And they claim that intelligence report warned uh, that uh, crisis will be uh, coming and they did this in November, which is interesting because uh, the first case reported by China was uh, in December. Well, uh, later they corrected this story saying that um, it was uh, a comment from Pentagon saying there's no such information whatsoever. So uh, whether they make it up or not, I don't know. Okay, now uh, we go back to our topic, and this is basically data and modeling. So first of all, general comment that it's very hard to make predictions, especially about future. So here's my sources of information, of statistical information. I will give you citations most of the time, but if I forget something, this is where I get information from. So most of the data are taken from this site. So uh, this site, which was uh, Johns Hopkins University supported site, was my favorite for a while, but not anymore because they reduce gradually the number of, uh, the amount of information they present. It's less and less presented. So at the beginning, for example, example, you could see uh, death rate per every, every day, uh, recovery, cases, and now they left only cases. So, and also you could upload, uh, download the data, not anymore. So this is now my favorite site, world metrics. There is a bit of difference between them. If you look at the numbers, uh, maybe 1% difference sometimes. But it's also different because uh, world metrics is using British time. So they have a change of day at zero GM, uh, GMT. And uh, this is US based site. So they use some American side, uh, time. I don't know which one exactly. And uh, then I use some statistics from uh, the government sources in the United States and some other things. Okay. So this is about the data. So now before you do any modeling, 
and claim any success in modeling, uh, you should make some benchmark. For example, when you predict weather and you don't know anything about weather, anything at all, but simply predict weather for tomorrow, like today. Statistically speaking, your success rate will be around 70%. This means that um, success of prediction is anything above this level, above 70%, because you don't do anything just predict the same weather as today and you have it's right 70 times out of 100. So this is my benchmark. So I have here just two examples of a number of cases in the United States and Australia and Queensland. Uh, and uh, what I did here, I put it on a log scale and then, uh, or take the log actually of these uh, values and then um, make a simple feed of second order polynomial. For example, in the case of United States, I did not use all the points. So I use only points from here to here. So the last three points, also they already uh, reported, were not used for fitting. So I, this is my forward prediction. So you see that uh, I can do three days very well without any knowledge whatsoever about this data. I don't even need to know what these data are. So three days and maybe four, so we'll see tomorrow. Um, and uh, similar things work very well also for Australia. And other simple conclusion, like um, uh, people say that uh, modeling suggests that we are flattening the curve in Australia. Well, do you really need modeling? Because um, uh, you can make a straight line through this point at the beginning, and then uh, uh, certainly, if you do nothing and keep going, that number of cases in Australia would grow like that. So now we have this, so the curve is flattening. I don't need any modeling, I can see it. So now, uh, first rule that uh, you learn when you look at different kind of mod different sort of modeling, which you can find here and there, uh, is that. Um, never regret, you will never regret if you give a good margin. So this is an example of modeling from some uh, Boston consulting group. They have a model and some predictions. How are the margin here? This is a log scale for, uh, from here. So this is one order of magnitude. So from here to here is three orders of magnitude. So they make a prediction and they put some margins, three orders of magnitude. So 300 times up and 300 times down, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, 30 times up and 30 times down from the middle. Uh, certainly they will be very well within this margin, but it's almost like meaningless. You may say, okay, let's make factor two. Factor two is dangerous. So this is another site uh, from University of Washington, Institute of Health and Metrics and Evaluation. Health uh, Metrics and Evaluation. This is their site and uh, they make a model and they do various predictions for a number of beds will, which will be required in the future, a number of uh, deaths, total deaths and so on. So this is uh, their prediction. The last real point was on April 1st. So this is the last point and this is April 1st. And then they make prediction, for example, that uh, the total number of uh, casualties in the United States will saturate slightly above 80,000. That was not the first prediction they made. It was the first where I have made uh, the screenshot. Now, uh, a bit later, so on April 7, they have to make some corrections because now uh, the level, uh, saturated level uh, uh, of um, 
number of deaths in the United States is 60 case. So it was 80,000, now 60,000, just two days later. So and now they have this prediction. I don't know how much you can trust, but according to this prediction, uh, United States has reached a maximum demand for uh, beds on April 11th, which was um, a day ago. So now the crisis is over. Of course, um, uh, these predictions are very important uh, for many people. For example, politicians, they want to have a prediction uh, where they have some horrifying figure, like uh, 30,000 people will die in Queensland if you do nothing. Uh, now we have um, uh, very few people actually died in Queensland. Of course, that's because um, uh, all these measures and effectiveness of the government, apparently. So uh, there is some push towards the projections where you have a lot of cases where people die. Uh, Scott Morrison has um, stressed that from the side of ABC uh, that uh, modeling of the government uh, does not give predictions and uh, will not uh, tell how many will get affected, how many will die in Australia. Modeling is only theoretical and is not based on Australian case data. So, so he does make uh, a strong case for his government because if this is the case, so he doesn't have anything to compare, like in this case, 30,000, make some number, make a million. So now we, I want to sh look at this data a bit closer. And first I will look at the data as they are, and then we will discuss uh, the meaning of these numbers. So this is from this site, uh, World of Metrics. So I have listed the top of um, um, countries which uh, have largest number of cases and uh, largest numbers of deaths and uh, uh, there's also recovery rate. So I also isolated separately for US, you have a totals and then you have specifically for New York State and uh, for New York, New York City. For New York City, they don't have uh, detailed information. So only a number of people who died. Well, you can make a proportion, but um, New York City is roughly half of the New York State. Now, um, when you look first at this data, there is a temptation to take this number and divide by this number and call that as a, uh, this is a mortality rate. I will explain terminology a bit later. So you simply divide this by this and that's what you get. However, you can do, a different thing. You can divide this D by the number of closed cases. So basically divide D by R, the number of recovered plus D. And you get, of course, a different number. So in all cases, this number will be larger than this number. So why is this? Well, the explanation is very simple. So when you get uh, somebody into a hospital and uh, he has a test and uh, you say uh, that the patient has uh, the case of uh, coronavirus. Usually it takes much longer to recover than to die. And, well, you may not die, but if you die, you usually, uh, die faster than people who recover. So basically, when you take these people, these 22,000, uh, these are the people who, were, who had the diagnosis of um, coronavirus some time ago. 
these are not the people who were where you detected the virus on on the day of uh, of your measurement. So, you, for example, on some particular day, uh, you detect new cases, and say you have two thousand new cases in the United States. Uh, then, of course, these people will not die on the spot. They will die later, some of them. Some of them will recover. But the number of people who died today, these are people where uh, you have detected a virus some days ago. There is a delay between death and case time. So what you can do here is um, try to match new cases and new deaths. So uh, that's what I did with uh, some simple MATLAB code. I took uh, this uh, line for United States that's um, new deaths per day. Every day you have new deaths and that's the point. For example, on this day there were about 1,000. Now they are around 2,000. The blue line is um, the number of cases on each day. However, I multiply by a number of cases, new cases, by a factor and also moved the blue line to the left until I have the most reliable match between the two. That's the best match I could get. So what I can learn from here? I can learn that it, on average, it takes six days after a virus has been detected to die. And that the number of people with detected virus, uh, the percentage of, of people who die with detected virus is about 6%. That's this factor. So I multiply, I have to multiply blue line by 0 0.06 to match. This means that 6% of people who were de where, uh, you detect the virus will die. And it takes an average uh, 6.3 days. So I did the same for a number of countries. So for example, Italy, the famous case. So that's interesting because uh, this shift was only 2.2 days. Basically in Italy, once you detect the virus, it takes only two days to die. So probably they do the test when people are already almost dead. And uh, this ratio is uh, point 0.14. So you can say that once you have a virus detected in Italy, your chance to die is 14%. But don't rush to the conclusion about the meaning of all these numbers that we'll discuss later. Spain, well, 1.4 days, even shorter. UK. UK has uh, 5.8 days, but the factor is 0.2. So it's 20% probability to die once uh, you have virus attacks in UK. Belgium, that's uh, the highest number I could find uh, if I consider countries where there is a significant number of uh, cases. Because of course, there's a there are small countries where this just fluctuates like crazy, so you don't have it. It's at the biggest fluctuates always because you have few cases. So in Belgium, it's 25% uh, as it's been. And this is pretty accurate match, actually. If you look carefully, you can see that blue line and red are pretty much uh, synchronized. But you have to multiply by this 25, 0.25. A remarkable uh, feature of Belgium case that the shift is 12 days. This means I can be almost confident that the number of new deaths in Belgium for the next 12 days, this is uh, today, uh, will be uh, basically the same as uh, in the last three days. So it will uh, uh, oscillate around um, 300, maybe 350 sometimes, but it will continue 
for the next 12 days, unless there will be some miracle, like uh, they found a pill and you give it to everybody and everybody is healthy. Or maybe there was a change in uh, the way they measure or they do the tests. Maybe they have changed the rules suddenly and uh, all these points are now taken from the entire population of Belgium as before it was taken over from the people who come into the hospital, something like that. So unless, unless some dramatic change happens, it will continue the same uh, rate of death for the next 12 days. Well, uh, finally, Germany, Germany is uh, also good in detecting because it takes uh, 12 days on average to die in Germany, but it's only less than 4%. So this is a bit uh, really interesting because uh, Belgium and Germany, why is that difference? So Belgium detects virus pretty early, unlike Spain, but doesn't help people die. In Germany, you can say maybe they use this uh, 12 days for some treatment. I don't know the reason, but uh, that's how the data look like. So I put these uh, numbers in the table I showed before. So now this is uh, uh, death to case ratio now, adjusted for a delay. So in US it's about 6%, Spain 11, Italy 14, uh, Germany less than four, UK, Belgium, and the delay. So you see this is very different. So you can try to speculate what is the reason for this difference and for this difference. But it is uh, really hard. I, I will talk about this a bit later. So now I can just go back to this um, uh, side where they have predictions for all different countries. So for example, here is Belgium. Uh, they, the last point here was April 9th. So when uh, uh, it's only quite flattened. So if you go back to this Belgium, uh, three days ago, where's Belgium here? So about here. And this blue curve was measured up to here. So you could really make very good prediction for the next 12 days, unless something happened. How would they give this very big margin? So I don't really know what is the motivation for have a, a margin like here. April uh, 12, they predicted between almost 4,000 and less than three. So why such a big margin? Because from uh, what I see, it could be pretty accurate prediction, maybe plus minus hundreds. Um, uh, for Belgium, they also have uh, predicted that it will, uh, that's a, just a different way to present the same data. Italy, uh, they say that Italy will go down very quickly. I don't see this from uh, this simple fitting, unless they expect that the number of new cases will go down dramatically. But for example, for uh, April 11, from here, uh, April 11, it's only, so this is April 9. So from April 11, they predict there will be 281, but they, in reality it was uh, about four, uh, 400. Uh, a very simple prediction from uh, my MATLAB simulations. Okay, now um, what I want to do next is to talk about um, uh, data. So is this really something um, which you can analyze or maybe we need new data, different kind of data. So what, uh, do, what do we want to know about this? Well, uh, we don't know the number of infected people, the number of people who die or will die and the number of people who will recover, that kind of things. So for the purpose of uh, management, we need to know the number of active cases. That's the difference. So in the modeling that we remember uh, our seminar 
a week ago, they combined these together and called removed from the population. They, well, they are removed, but uh, for us it is um, important what way they are removed. Uh, you die or you recover. It's removed from people who may be infected, but uh, a big difference. So we want to know, for example, how many will be infected. We want to know how many people will die. And maybe we want to know this number and compare to some other numbers, like number of car accidents. So the first big problem with all this uh, data, which are reported at least uh, publicly, is that uh, we don't know a lot of things. The first thing we don't know is the number of asymptotic, uh, asymptomatic, uh, sorry, asymptomatic cases. And uh, it is very hard to measure this number with what has been done so far. There are ways to do this, but it is not yet done. So what is the problem? So if somebody is asymptomatic, so has no symptoms, nothing, no fever, no, nothing at all, feels good. There is no reason to go to a hospital and do a test. And uh, it's not even recommended to do this because if you go to a hospital, you are more likely to be in contact there with uh, sick people because sick people have a habit to go to hospitals. So if you stay at home, if you feel healthy and good, stay at home. Don't go to hospital because uh, people, sick people are there. Therefore, we don't really know, never do a test on healthy people. So in China, they made a lot of efforts to trace all the contacts. So for example, if you detect somebody with a virus, who is already sick and uh, was, uh, went to hospital and you detect a virus, then they try to find all the contacts that he had. And maybe even some contacts of contacts if the contacts have a virus. In that way, you can find somebody who was in contact with sick person and do tests on him or her. And then you find a virus on that person, but there is no symptoms. That's how you do this asymptomatic uh, figure in China, or this, how they did it. And they estimated that uh, four fifths of cases in China were asymptomatic. This means that 80% of people who had the virus had no symptoms. That's remarkable. So how does it compare to flu, for example? Well, to my surprise, this is a very inaccurate figure for flu as well. At least uh, different papers claim slightly, uh, significantly different numbers, but this is uh, such, which looks to me uh, as a very reliable methodologically. Well, I'm not the expert in uh, medicine, but they explain how you did it and I can trust that it's, if it's done properly, as I say, it could work. So basically they did not really ask people about uh, their contacts. They simply take a certain number of people, they've chosen this from population, like a few thousand, I don't remember this number, somewhere in the paper. And they do something which is very different from detecting a virus. They took blood sample from these people and they tried to detect antibodies. So you don't detect the virus because if you were sick and had very good response of your immu immune system, then you will not get sick, really, you will not feel sick, 
and you will remove the virus from the system. So if somebody detects you and detect, um, uh, try to detect the virus, well, they will find nothing because it's already gone. You're healthy again. So what they, but your blood will still have antibodies. So that's how your immune system works. They have antibodies and they, so they detect the antibodies and then um, uh, before uh, the break of uh, flu uh, season and uh, then sometime later and then found that basically 75% had no symptoms in the case of flu. So in the case of uh, uh, this uh, COVID-19, it was 80%, but it was much less reliable. Well, there was some uh, work done on um, people who had no symptoms and there were some claims that it may be not as um, uh, good as it sounds because maybe sometimes you can find some damage in your lungs. So this is um, a study in Japan where they use this uh, guinea pigs from the prince, uh, Diamond Princess. So uh, you know there was a, a ship near uh, Japan with uh, a lot of sick people, about uh, 700 or 800. And they were, got sick and they were then transferred to the hospital. But uh, all these people were uh, on a ship, so they could also do the test from uh, on the people who did not feel any symptoms. And sometimes they found uh, this damage in the lungs. This is uh, a CT scan and uh, cross session. And well, I'm not a medical doctor, but they say that this uh, less transparent area in the lungs is indication of the damage due to the virus. Well, you cannot be 100% sure because they did not do this scan before uh, the virus. Maybe they, these people had this before. But anyway. Uh, there were some question marks. Uh, uh, I, I would, if you were interested in this, you could really listen to this guy. So this is a professor of medicine from Stanford. And uh, he, uh, the st Stanford is locked down. So basically, you, if you work at Stanford, well, at the time of this interview, that was a couple of weeks ago, uh, you could not actually go there unless you have a special permission saying that you are very important and your work is important and then you can. So this uh, uh, professor was uh, important for Stanford, so he was given a permission. So he's uh, sitting in his office at Stanford and uh, the guy who is talking to him is at home because he was not important. So basically a brief summary of what is um, in this interview. So the first point is that we don't really know how many people are infected. Because uh, as I explained to you, when you simply detect a virus, you detect, you only take into account sick people because healthy people don't go and don't do the test. So you have to do a different test. You have to do a test which will detect presence of antibodies. And then uh, these tests at the time of the interview, they were not yet available in the United States. So it's not a trivial exercise to uh, make tests for a specific uh, virus antibodies, but they were kind of, uh, Coming. So he was talking about uh, time scale of weeks. Um, also, he mentioned that uh, they have a bit of difficulty with uh, funding for this job, which was really surprising to me because um, given that uh, United States allocated trillions of dollars, trillions for managing this uh, situation, uh, they seems to be uh, not asking for trillions, they're asking for millions. But anyway, I don't know. Maybe they already have the funding. It was two weeks ago. 
So that's basically what he said, that you have to do this test and you have to do this test national wide. A representative sample which covers the entire country. And then you know how many people had uh, ha or have uh, these antibodies. And then you take the number of people who die due to the disease and divide by the number of ever infected people, not the people who visit the hospital, but the people who have antibodies. And that will be your uh, uh, fatality rate, fatality rate. This is important. And also he mentioned that in uh, his opinion that uh, maybe these outbreaks of new virus will become more and more irregular. So you already remember a few in, in the last 10 years, or maybe a bit longer. And he said because of um, communication, more frequent travel and uh, globalization and uh, more contact between people, it will become new normal. So this sort of research is crucial, M much more important in terms of uh, country and nations. This kind of research is more important because basically it tells what's going on in the country, not what's going on with a particular person. So if you go to a hospital, of course, for a doctor, it is important to know whether you have this virus or not. But for the nation, it is uh, this nation which is important. And also, this number is a bit uh, disputable. So at least some doctors are um, not really sure that whenever you detect a virus and people die, you can claim that the reason for dying is a virus. So people may die. Uh, a lot of people die because they're already sick. They have cancer, uh, diabetes, they have all sorts of diseases already and they will die soon, probably anyway. So they, maybe the virus did something, maybe not. It's a bit hard to tell. And um, uh, so the number of deaths and number of cases in that table is a bit of question, or a lot of questions may be raised. So even terminology used in mass media is not really consistent. For example, just recently, a few hours ago, I, I read that mortality rate for the coronavirus is estimated to be 3%. Well, probably it's okay for general public because they don't really care about definition, but mortality is the ratio of people who died to the total population. So if it were really 3%, that would be a real disaster already. Uh, uh, the more correct terminology would be uh, the fatality. So how many people die who actually got sick, who had the virus? Not got really uh, symptomatic, uh, but uh, had the virus. And then multiply by 100 to get uh, the percentage. At least uh, that's what uh, Wikipedia or wiki lectures tales. So I trust Vicky. Okay, now um, I don't know uh, how it's going into this in the group of this um, guy from Stanford, but very recently there were already some publications. Of course, uh, not just United States. Everybody understands the importance of uh, these tests on antibodies, and uh, few reports already published in some way. So, for example, in Germany, this is in German. Uh, but uh, this is a result, and uh, here's a bit uh, online summary. What they say, they did uh, 1,000 tests, and they estimated that uh, the number of people who actually die divided by the number who were infected by the virus is 0.37%. Uh, that's a very inaccurate estimate because the sample is very small, but it is a number which is an order of magnitude at least smaller than uh, 
what you get for Germany with my fitting. Remember, uh, when you do the fitting proper shift time and scaling, you get something like 3.9%. Uh, but if you do it properly, then uh, at least according to this result, it's 10 times smaller. So Denmark also did something. However, they uh, used uh, blood from donors. So uh, they still take blood from donors. So they have the sample of blood from 1,487 donors and did the antibody test. And uh, in 22 cases, they found the uh, antibodies already. I mean, people did not complain about anything, but they had antibodies specific to that virus. Well, it's a bit of a uh, stretch to extrapolate these numbers to the nation. But if you do this, so basically this is a population of Denmark and then you multiply by this ratio to get probable number of people with antibodies in the country. And then you divide the number of people who died at that time by this number, uh, I, I drop one zero, so it's uh, misprint. So you have 0.33%, very, pretty close actually. And then in the United States, there was some tests done in Colorado. So there was about 1000 tests and uh, eight were positive, 23, they were not sure, maybe there was not enough antibodies, but sort of ambiguous. Maybe yes, maybe no, but absolutely confident that in eight cases they had uh, antibodies. Well, this even big extrapolation from these eight tests to the entire population of the United States, but you get 2.6 million. And then you calculate the ratio of uh, dead people. So uh, divide uh, the number of people who died by this number and you get 0.5%, pretty close. Well, you may say this is eight positive tests is a bit of stretch. Well, first of all, there are 23 ambiguous. And then um, there may be some of them may be actually positive. Here they are confident it's positive. Here may be positive, maybe not. And also they did this in uh, some remote area of Colorado. So you can speculate that in densely populated area, you will have more people with um, uh, more contacts and more likely people to have antibodies already by this time. So it may be that it's actually a bit of overestimate, maybe it's smaller, maybe it's again 0.3. Well, there are some, this is good news, there are some not so good news. So this is a recent publication in PNAS where they built a map for this coronavirus. They called A, B, and C. A was the very first one, so this is a bat or whatever the animal they think. So that was the first version of this virus who was transferred to humans. That's uh, uh, A, type A. So countries are in color. So now then it was next generation of uh, this virus they called family B, it's not a single virus, there are some variations within the family, but it's a B. So in China, most of the cases is actually B, but there's a significant uh, number of cases type A. Uh, in Australia, it's type A most of the time. So Australia is this color, I don't know if you can see the color, but here is Australia, that's uh, type A. So these all dots are modifications, little modification of type A. There are some type C cases, all of them are in Sydney. And type C cases are the cases of Italy. Uh, but uh, maybe the, these are cases from the ship, I don't know really. So now the story is that 
type A was actually the first one and is least dangerous out of all three. So they speculate that it is possible, and it's no, I mean, it's just fantasy, there's no proof. It is possible that this type A was already transferred to humans as early as September last year in Asia. And effectively, it was unnoticed because it was not so dangerous. However, it was kind of uh, immunity developed due to this virus. So this is why uh, they tried to explain the huge difference between uh, Asia, like uh, China, Korea, Vietnam, a lot of countries in Asia, they have control over this disease. Well, we have different explanations, maybe some political, but uh, at least this kind of reason may be why they have uh, not so severe cases, because uh, they had preliminary they had type A and then only type B. So if this is the case, then we are a very lucky country again, because we got type A first and very little type C and uh, no type B. So type B seems to be the worst. Well, that's what they, it looks like. Okay, um, now given all these uncertainties, I want to show another graph which has nothing to do with virus directly, but um, this is a number of new claims, unemployment claims in the United States. So in the last three weeks, there was almost 20 million claims of 17 million almost. So this point, so here in this curve, every week is a point. It's not average in any way. So this is last 30, uh, 45 years, 50 years. This is the last week. Well, not the last week uh, really, but um, one of the three last weeks. They still don't have the, uh, the data for the, for the current week. So 6 million, or uh, in three weeks, 16.8. So average per week will be 5.5. So this is the entire data for the last 50 years. So it's never, never above a million. So this is the price the economy pays for all these lockdowns. Well, if you look at this data uh, now, I mean, you have to put in on some scale. And you see that this scale shows something which is um, not so easy to explain. So this is a data for United States. So this is number of uh, uh, people dying in the United States every year for all the causes, for all this heart disease, cancer, accidents, uh, everything. That's uh, 2.8 million. That's the number per week. Now, if you look into data for New York's uh, state, that's uh, for New York state, and this is for New York state per week. So this is New York state per last week. So the, la the last seven days, roughly 5,000. So now you can see that this number is almost two times larger than the number of people died uh, on this week on average a year ago. So basically, uh, it's really, really very big difference for New York. It will be even larger for New York City because uh, most people who died in New York State actually uh, were dying in New York City. However, New York is very special for the United States. So why is there such a big difference? I think the only research will tell. 
So, and we actually have to understand what to do with all this. Yes, I mean, these data, the tests, the antibody tests and uh, national wide research, because then, as soon as you have antibody, you're free to go. I mean, you have immunity. No matter whether you have vaccine or not, if you have antibody somehow, uh, you have to go anywhere. So this is uh, uh, to, to make such, such decision really like this. We need to understand what is this. This is uh, all the pandemics in history which were identified somehow. Some of these numbers are not very reliable like this one. And also some of these big numbers also sort of estimate. So this is the, <clears throat> the current state of current COVID-19 that's sitting here. Uh, well above Ebola and MERS and SARS, but still a bit short of uh, yellow fever. Version of flu, which were not so long ago. And of course, we should really not need to know, is this things like something like this, like this or like this, or maybe it will be something like that. So at this moment, we don't know. There is no data really. Well, yeah, I have to conclude already. I'm sorry, a bit uh, takes so long. Um, so think deep, good science, and do not panic. That's something from um, uh, from this uh, article on the newspaper. And just to finish on the positive note. That's my suggestion how to enforce social distancing. That's how we should do it. And this is the end. Well, thank you. Uh, let's do again the three, two, one count clap. It seemed to work last time. So three, two, one. Thank you. Yeah, that was an enlightening talk, uh, a lot of information. Uh, let, let's take just a few minutes for discussion. So go ahead, guys. Thank you, Tars. You're welcome. I'll, I'll open with a question. So the it, it, your method of fitting the death